Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a true pleasure to uh, be around so many friends, and most of them have come to see my former colleague and uh, inspiration for the electronics of the IMB uh, detector, who then went on to Fermilab to do absolutely wonderful work. Uh, part of it was to invent a new uh, accelerator that should have been supported and uh, we would be much further along if it had. Uh, smitten by uh, the hope that Washington would somehow help us by uh, uh, better funding, for instance, to Fermilab so he could realize his machine, uh, he decided to follow in the footsteps of his family and go to Washington and try to make change. Unfortunately, uh, at least from my perspective, he's, uh, he's got a great brain and can make in infinitely good things happen, but he's been stymied for seven years. So I admire him for his persistence, his ability to continue to get funded, and I'm pleased that he's here to uh, uh, say a few words and uh, take some questions. Thank you, Bill. Well, and, and thank you. For those of you who don't know, you know, Larry Sulek, who's getting the Panofsky Prize here, uh, was my uh, thesis advisor at, at Harvard. Um, so anyway, now if this is now alive, okay, great. Um, so this is, uh, what I'm gonna do is just start out with um, uh, basically a recruiting speech that I gave uh, uh, to try to get uh, scientists to get into politics. Um, this was originally given, or most recently given, at the uh, set of, um, a meeting of the AAAS fellows who are, are medium, you know, entry, sort of mid-scale scientific careers who are thinking of coming into working in public policy, and it is a great avenue. Um, you know, my former colleague, Rush Holt, uh, came in as a AAAS fellow and is now running the AAAS, uh, but is, um, anyway, so this is, so, you know, you will notice, um, I'll start out with sort of a brief introduction to me. Uh, you know, I've had, I've had the, followed the sort of, um, you know, traditional, uh, the traditional pathway from uh, theatrical stage lighting to high energy particle physics to the United States Congress, so I'm just another one of those. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what life is actually like compared to the reputation of what life is like in Congress. Um, some policy comments on everything from the Iran nuclear deal to um, other things. Um, and then most of what I'd like to do here is just answer questions. So these will be slides. I remember in grad school we had a unit uh, which was called the Rubia, named for Carlo Rubia, which was one slide per second. All right, so this will be, be somewhere around 300 millirubias. And so I am, uh, well, let's see, at the time I made this slide, I was one of two PhD scientists in Congress. Now I'm the only one that's left with the retirement of Rush Holt. And, uh, but interestingly, I'm only one of uh, about a quarter of the member of Congress that have a business background as well. I mean, the place is really being run by a bunch of lawyers and career politicians, and that's uh, the demographic reality of it. Uh, I did an interesting, um, I made an interesting plot a few years ago where I wrote a script that went, ripped through the bios of all of the uh, members of the ruling councils of different countries. And then by triggering on keywords, I separated them into lawyers and, or technical people, engineers or scientists. Um, or everyone else who I called career politicians. And so, and you know, if you have three numbers that add up to 100%, uh, you know, you can think of it as a relativistic Dalitz plot if that's uh, your, your background, or, a, um, or if you're a metallurgist, I guess, a ternary alloy plot. Uh, if you have three numbers that add up to 100%, you can plot them on a triangle. And, and so you can see that the European Commission is the dot in the center. It's an equal mixture, roughly, of, of scientists, technical people, lawyers, and, and everyone else. Uh, the U.S. Congress, you can see, is down there. The apex there at the top is 100% science and engineers. The line uh, along the bottom is 0% scientists, which is pretty much where the, the U.S. Congress uh, exists, uh, as, as well as the U.S. state houses. Um, and so my uh, personal journey started when I was 19 years old when my younger brother and I started this company in our basement that now makes about 70% of all the theater lighting equipment in the United States, including the lights here, our, our company's equipment, you know, the 90% of the lights on Broadway, uh, you know, 50% of touring rock and roll, um, and just 70% of churches, schools, community theaters. Uh, we started the company in our basement, and after a while, Dad kicked us out of the basement. Uh, and so we moved up to my bedroom. Uh, 
uh, which is the, where this picture is. Um, and you can see my physics textbooks on the right there sort of falling into disuse as our company ramps up. And these were preparing to ship our first, uh, first item here. Um, oh, okay, well, let's see, yeah, so that's, I don't know, does this work? Or here, I can, in fact, I, in, in principle, this works on, on the screen, yeah. And so anyway, so that's me with a cute little flip there and, uh, and my, my younger brother and, and you know, various possibly recognizable textbooks on quantum mechanics and optics and so on. And, and now to sort of get a feeling for the demographics of this, the question I ask, how many of you remember eight inch floppy disk drives? Okay, all right. So, so that's what, what powered our, our first device along with an eight bit microprocessor. Um, during, uh, during my time with the company, we did a number of projects, one of which is the controller for the Disneyland Main Street Electrical Parade. I actually played hooky when we were installing the electronics for my experiment. I took a, a couple of weeks off during a rather crucial installation phase to go complete a contract uh, to design and build the parade controller for the Disneyland Main Street Electrical Parade. So which uh, for uh, more than 20 years ran, the, uh, ran uh, Disneyland. More recently, our company has done uh, the, uh, this is the London Olympics. Um, uh, if you visit Chicago, downtown and Millennium Park, they have a number of uh, lighting uh, things. The Lyric Opera, um, the Metropolitan Opera, you know, most of the shows on Broadway. And so we started our company in a tiny little metal shed in a cornfield when we got our first big order. And the company now has, actually the slide is old, it just went over 1,200 employees uh, in a very large metal building in a cornfield outside Madison, Wisconsin, where I grew up. Um, and this is a picture from a, a few years ago of my younger brother and me with our prototype. Uh, how many of you remember wire wrapping? Okay, all right, so this was our wire wrap prototype from uh, more than 40 years ago now. Um, and, and this is a photograph that shows more than anything the ravages of testosterone on the male hairline. Uh, so. <laughs> And now, um, so then I, after running the campaign, the campaign, the, the business for most of a, uh, most of a decade, I returned my first love, which is physics, where under Larry Sulak's guidance, I got my PhD uh, looking for proton decay in the, the IMB proton decay experiment. And those of you who are fans of, of Woody Allen films may remember in Stardust Memories, he goes on and on for like a minute and a half about, he's just read in the New York Times, the prediction from the theorists that protons will decay and this is how the universe will end. And so he goes on and on about how, you know, his, not only his stupid little films, but eventually Beethoven, Shakespeare, and everything will be gone. So this was, you know, this was mainstream belief, not only in theoretical physics, but in, in the public culture. Um, and so to test this, you know, if you're looking for a, a lifetime in the range of 10 to the 33rd years, there are really two basic strategies. Uh, the first one is to, uh, uh, to take a single proton and watch it for 10 to the 33rd years. Uh, the other one is to get 10 to the 33rd protons and watch it for a year. And if you're a graduate student interested in getting his PhD thesis in a reasonable amount of time, that second strategy is preferable, uh, which corresponds to a tank of water the size of a six-story building, which is what we built in a salt mine underneath Cleveland, under Larry's guidance and the, and the collaboration, the entire IMB collaboration. Um, and so this is actually a diver who may or may not be Steve Aretti, who may be known to some of you. Um, that, that is actually Steve, yeah, we had multiple divers, but one of them was Steve Aretti, a physicist from um, uh, Urbana-Champaign who, um, who actually went diving in our so those are 2,000 photomultiplier tubes surrounding this cube of ultra-pure water. Um, anyway, so we, we didn't see um, a proton decay, but, um, but you know, 160,000 years ago, a star went a supernova in the Greater Magellanic Cloud, and for 160,000 years, the burst of light and the burst of neutrinos traveled to the Earth. They arrived in 1987, and we saw simultaneously you know, the, the flash of light that the astronomers saw and the burst of neutrinos. At, uh, at I guess three detectors uh, underground. So it ended up being very, uh, very successful for unanticipated reasons, which, well, unanticipated everyone except Larry Sulak, who realized that this was one of the great things it could do uh, when we built the detector. So I spent most of my career at Fermilab, um, where for that whole time we were just smashing protons and antiprotons together to build, to make particles that have not been around since the Big Bang. Um, and I, uh, I grew up, I, I raised my family uh, in the area around Fermilab. And so um, this is, let's see, that one 
Um, that one is, he actually started out pretty well in life. He's not, he was a, he started out, got a degree in math and computer science, and then tragically, a few years ago, he told my wife and I that he was going back to law school. And, um, and so this, uh, and now he's a very successful patent attorney downtown. But it really goes to show that no matter how hard you try to teach your children right from wrong, there's some chance they'll end up as lawyers. Uh, and then, and then uh, my daughter's doing healthcare data analytics at Yale. Um, so, all right, there we go. So I spent uh, the first 10 years really uh, uh, designing, building, analyzing the data from detectors, uh, uh, largely, well, entirely, actually, the, the collider detector at Fermilab. So, um, and so, you know, I was one of the many collaborators on, on the paper announcing the discovery of the top quark, uh, the heaviest known form of matter. Um, and it was actually nice when we had the uh, congressional reception um, uh, congratulating the, uh, my, many of my collaborators who had gone to CERN and were involved in the discovery of the Higgs boson. Uh, so I had the opportunity to, dis to congratulate them all on having discovered the second most massive uh, particle, which is, anyway. Physicists are like that, I guess. The, um, anyway, the, uh, I was involved in the, uh, very much in the, the EMU channel for the discovery of the top quark. It was one of the things that I was one of the, actually, two people that did a lot of work on it. And um, this is actually, uh, wrote the software that was used to display events. So lots of the, of the PR photos that you see for the discovery of the top quark was actually software that I wrote. Um, and this is how you did data analysis back then, where you made transparencies and then got out a felt tip pen and, and made a cut and then counted the number of crosses on the, the printer output. And, and that's the way uh, we, this was, I guess this excluded a top mass uh, below 40 GeV for this particular analysis that I presented to the collaboration a while ago. Um, after about a decade, I then switched to accelerators. Uh, and this is my collaborator, Jerry Jackson, who collaborated on many of my projects. Uh, this is in the tunnels underground at, at Fermilab. Uh, the, you, know, you saw in the earlier picture two large rings, the first one the superconducting Tevatron, the second one the main injector ring, but also in that same second tunnel was a set of green magnets up there, the antiproton recycler ring, which is a thing that uh, Jerry and I invented and, and um, I led the teams that built the, all the magnets for it. Um, we worked on a number of other projects. This one is a, um, a, a very cheap magnet built around a 100,000 ampere superconducting uh, power transmission line. And so you have to, to build and test such a thing, you actually have to build a 100,000 ampere uh, power transmission line, which we did, and, and the power supply, the, the warm to cold transition, as well as the segment of the transmission line. And that's the team of people that did it uh, on the, the morning that we uh, successful, successfully commissioned it. Um, you know, working at Fermilab and, and all international uh, laboratories is just, it's wonderful because of the diversity of the collaboration. Uh, these are, I, and this was an accelerator project um, where, where we had collaborators from Italy, Great Britain, Korea, and me working in, in, in the U.S. Um, just working on a wide variety of things. And it's, it's really one of the great things about science collaboration. And in, in Congress, I am working very hard to get that message out that we have to support international collaboration because it's just good for, it's good for the world. And you know, CERN is the model for that. There's a very interesting model uh, that's uh, you know, under some stress but is going forward in Jordan, a project called Sesame that Herman Winnick, if you know him, uh, has been pushing for a long time. And it is a synchrotron light source with a collaboration that includes Israel, includes Iran, and everyone in between. And so it's really, um, it's an impressive uh, you know, demonstration of, of what you can do when you just try to get the politicians out of the way and have the scientists try to work together. Um, this, this was also interesting. Um, the circuit that I designed for the, the beam dampers for the main injector uh, were based on field programmable gate arrays. And uh, during, not long after the, I'm on the Financial Services Committee, and not long after that, we had what was called the flash crash, where there was a lot of this electronic trading was blamed for, for this you know, trillion dollar swing in the valuation of the markets. And so we, I, a lot of the, um, of the high frequency trading firms came up to me, you know, came to my office and did interviews explaining how it wasn't possibly their fault. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is that then they said they were bragging about how um, they were trading so fast that computers were now too slow and they were switching over to field programmable gate arrays. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's old stuff. We did that at Fermilab, you know, last decade. 
And so, and then of course they wanted to hire me. But anyway, so then the question I always get at this point is, you know, I, I got married, I raised a family, had a reasonably interesting career in, in physics and business, so why on God's green earth would you go into, into politics, particularly the way it is, uh, you know, it's practiced in the U.S. today? And my quick answer to that is that I tragically fell prey to the family's recessive gene for adult onset political activism. Uh, this is something that actually runs in my family. My dad was a, was a scientist who became a civil rights lawyer and wrote a lot of the enforcement language behind the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, my mother uh, worked for Senator Paul Douglas, who's on the right there. Uh, senator Paul Douglas is a famous senator from Illinois. Uh, he is also, those of you who've been suffer, who suffered through macroeconomics may remember the Cobb-Douglas production function, which is a parameterization of how a business splits its investment between capital and labor uh, to maximize output. And the Douglas in the Cobb-Douglas production function was Senator Paul Douglas of Illinois. Uh, so that, uh, who my mom worked for. And I had a sort of epiphany uh, during the financial crisis when we were designing the stimulus, we invited all sorts of experts to come in and explain how we should design the stimulus to get the maximum bang for the buck. And so uh, one, of the, one of our witnesses who runs a big macroeconomics group at moodyseconomy.com, um, and I asked him if I could see the source code for his, uh, for his simulation of the economy that he used. And he's sort of startled, and after some non-disclosure agreements, I got to see all the formulas and, and, and the code. And, um, and so buried at the heart of these models uh, for, uh, for all macroeconomic models that Federal Reserve, monetary policy, and everything depend upon is a modified form of the Cobb-Douglas production function. And so this is, it's just remarkable that this guy was a University of Chicago professor before he became a, a senator, so that you can do that. My father, as I mentioned, um, he was a chemist. He got a, a, a degree in chemistry from Stanford. Uh, during World War II, he designed fire control computers for the Navy. And most of the way through the war, started getting these reports of how many people had been killed by his team's equipment you know, this week. And he became very unhappy with how his skills were being used to hurt people. And so he came back from the war, thought about it for a while. Um, he'd grown up in Tennessee and saw a bunch of things that he didn't like about how blacks were treated. And so he saw civil rights as the great moral challenge of his generation. So he stepped away from his career in science um, and, uh, and worked in civil rights and ended up, um, ended up, as I mentioned, writing most of the enforcement language behind the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was actually reading his papers after he passed away a little more than a decade ago that I first started thinking about you know, this fundamental question that everyone has to answer about you know, what fraction of your life you spend in service to your fellow man. Uh, you know, this is an interesting optimization. For most people, the, the number is not zero and it's not 100%. Uh, but for me, uh, you know, having a, you know, good careers in science and having great fun, I still felt the need to spend part of my life in service to fellow man, and that as much as anything is what dragged me to Congress. Oh, there's the Cobb-Douglas production function. It's one of the top 100 papers of the 20th century. Uh, it has partial derivatives in. You know, and if you just look at how the debate in Congress over economic policy has fallen, when you go from, a, from Paul Douglas to Paul Ryan, it, 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 is, it is pretty amazing. Okay, many scientists come up to me and say, you know, maybe I have what it takes to run for office. And so this is the test that I give them. I ask them to pronounce this word. And if they pronounce it unionized, then I just tell them, okay, they have a great career ahead of them in the laboratory and they should just stay there. Uh, so in around 2006, I left science, and uh, the first thing I did in politics was actually to volunteer for a campaign. I had a deal with, I asked around to find a, a contested election, uh, and one in which they had a, a campaign manager with a very good reputation for, you know, doing things well. And so I was led to um, uh, the Patrick Murphy 2006 campaign for Congress in, in northwest suburban Philadelphia, which is a sort of rough and tumble area. Uh, and so I just volunteered. I had to deal with a campaign manager. I wanted to do every job in the campaign, which I ended up doing um, by the end of the campaign, except for maybe the photo shoot, which is kind of a candidate thing. Uh, so we ended up winning by about 2,000 votes, a razor-thin election, and then after we won, I started the 110th Congress working for uh, Congressman Patrick Murphy um, as an intern. Uh, so I started the 110th Congress as an intern, worked there for five months, then went back and started my campaign. 
um, against, uh, against Dennis Hastert. And then, um, and then halfway through that campaign, Dennis Hastert quit to become a lobbyist, and that triggered a special election, which I was fortunate enough to win. Uh, and so I actually ended up ending the, starting the 110th Congress as an intern and ending it as a sitting congressman. And so I had, I had the opportunity, actually, after I won the election, the special election, um, I went back to the office of uh, 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 Representative Murphy and, um, and to the intern's desk where I'd worked for five months. And there was a new intern then, you know, it's a tiny little, tiny little desk in a closet, literally in a closet. Um, and there was a new intern there. And so I told her two things. That first, I had left my tie in the lower left-hand drawer, and could she please fish it out? And so she fished it out, and I put my tie on. And then I told her that she, too, had five months before she had to go back home and start running for Congress. So anyway, so this is the, um, the district I currently represent. Uh, and you don't want to get me started about gerrymandering. It's, it's, it's one, of the, one of the worst things in terms of the reputation of politics. Uh, uh, among in the general public, you know, they see these maps and they don't know exactly the mechanism, but they sort of know they're being rooked. And this is, it's just not good. Uh, my old district, the, the old Illinois 14th was equally gerrymandered, but by Dennis Hastert to make it a very favorable Republican district. Anyway, so that was, um, so that, so I started my campaign, you know, against the gentleman on the upper right, which I will not talk about further. Um, and, and then, so you start your campaign. Um, this, I think, is the second, um, the second parade that we ever had. Now, everyone there with the Foster t-shirts on there uh, is either a friend of mine from physics or my family. And so this is the scale at which you know campaigns start. It's the this is the way most campaigns start. It's the way uh, most of them die, actually. But sometimes you know if everything goes well, um, you know. Well, first off, it, it's just wonderful um, you know to be involved. You know, here I was this 50-some year old guy, and all of a sudden you're working with all these young kids who just they want to change the world. They're they're bright. They're energetic. And it's wonderful to work with them and then to watch them scatter off into the wilderness. Uh, let's see, that, that's actually my daughter. Uh, this guy um, is a, a high-powered lawyer in downtown Philadelphia. Uh, this guy is a political consultant who until uh, uh, not too long ago was Rahm Emanuel's um, like political enforcer in Chicago. <laughs> and, so, and, and she runs Senator Durbin's time whenever he's in Illinois. Um, you think about all sorts of things as a congressman that you never think about as a physicist. Um, you know, with the rare exception of when you're getting some award or something and you actually wear a tie, you never think about what tie to wear. But this is my favorite tie for a parade. Um, and so it's a Frank Lloyd Wright tie. And so uh, those that recognize it as a Frank Lloyd Wright tie um, will say, oh, it's wonderful, it's Bill Foster, he's thoughtful, it has an Illinois connection because of Frank Lloyd Wright, so it's sort of patriotic. Uh, those that don't recognize it will say, oh, it's red, white, and blue, go USA. <laughs> so it, it's something that sort of automatically adjusts itself. It's what they call auto-micro-targeting um, in the biz. Uh, you go to county fairs. And then you have long discussions with your campaign manager as to whether anyone who goes to county fairs actually votes, which is an open question in politics. So anyone that need a research project, uh, you learn about every, every corner of your community. Uh, you know, I uh, raised my children and grew up um, uh, very near Aurora, within a 50-minute you know, drive from Aurora. Uh, but I was introduced to all of the black churches and, and how many of you have seen the scene in uh, Blues Brothers that happens inside the, the church? Yeah, and it, it is just, it's just like that. It is just wonderful. And so I've become, over time, a real connoisseur of the really good bands that they have at the black churches yeah, throughout my community, of which there are more than, more than two dozen. And, she, and so she was my guide to all of the, the black churches. She's an alderman in Aurora, and just a wonderful woman. Um, my district... Uh, um, had a lot of farmers in it, and so you got to know farmers. And it turns out, you know, one of the you know, one of the things that's been happening over the last two two three generations is that you know the number of farmers has dropped a lot with the technology, uh, and that's one of the things that's I think really putting a strain on politics, the urban rural split in our country. But one of the the side effects of that is the farmers that remain are really really good businessmen, and so you can have just you take a typical farmer that's arrived, and he can have you can have a very sophisticated discussion of market manipulation and things like that. It, it, it was really a joy, as well as the technology and the biotechnology of modern farming. Um, 
and and then you know the supporters that you know they're it's a representational democracy that we have and um, and so what that means is that a lot of people don't have time to think and, and, and take the time to study in detail all the issues that you have to vote on. And that's your primary responsibility, to vote in the ways that your supporters would if they had time. Um, anyway, so if it, if it all goes well, um, on March 8, 2008, you can, is when I, I actually won my election. And there's a possibly recognizable senator, uh, my daughter, it's one of my favorite pictures. And, in the world, um, my swearing-in ceremony, uh, uh, March, uh, three days later, uh, which, the timing of that was interesting. Um, uh, so there are two points I want to make. The first is the timing on that. Uh, when I got, my, got sworn in, I think it was my second or third vote after getting my voting card, was I ended up casting the deciding vote in favor of House ethics reform. Uh, which was, uh, had been hung up in Congress for um, you know, years. And, um, and so what was actually going on there is that Rahm Emanuel, who was sort of you know, stage managing the operation, had been trying to get this vote passed and didn't have the votes. And then when I took over Dennis Hastert's seat, he kind of had a feeling on how I'd vote on House ethics reform. And so he realized he now had enough votes. And the moment I was sworn in, he brought that up for a vote. Uh, and so, and I, as I say, cast the deciding vote. The other thing is that you know people um, say that uh, uh, you know that no one gets along in Washington. Um, you know this is a, a rec I guess that's a possibly recognizable um, a former Speaker of the House, my mother, my brother, uh, my son, me. Um, but then here in, in Washington together, and both supporting my campaign, are my wife and my ex-wife, who are all big supporters. So this is the counterexample that you actually can get people together. Um, and, and many of you know um, uh, Asuk Bayan, who was second in command of the DOE Office of Science, actually when she quit to volunteer for my campaign and was later the project manager for the uh, NSLS2 um, upgrade in, in um, Brookhaven. Okay, and so I will, I will skip over the 2008 and, and stuff, and, but I just want to make one point about bipartisanship. You know, this is, you know, I, you, you probably at this point guessed which party I'm from. Uh, and, but there are times when my heart just goes out to members of other parties. I, I took office, uh, you know, with only a few months left in President Bush's term. And, and this is a picture at the, the Christmas party, the Congressional Ball. And if you are the President of the United States, uh, the Christmas, your Christmas party consists of having your photograph taken with all 535 members of Congress and their families. And you do that every one of the eight years that you're in office. And so this was, this was their last time. And they were just great when the cameras were on, but in between when the, when the cameras were off, you could just see it in their faces that, <laughs> that you know, this is the last time we're ever gonna do this for our Christmas party. Um, okay, and so that, what life is really like. You know, well, first off, you're scheduled 12 hours on a typical day, and you read yourself to sleep each night with a big stack of papers that your, your staff stuffs in your hand when you leave the office, and, and then, of course, the emails. Um, you know, I uh, rent a one-bedroom apartment in D.C., and then after the last votes on Friday, I come back um, most weekends. This is an exception. I had to negotiate heavily with my chief of staff to come back to a physics, uh, uh, physics meeting that has very little to do with my political life. Um, and then, of course, when I'm back in Illinois, I get scheduled up by my staff there. And so it's not, you know, some people think that it's all, um, you know, cocktail parties in Georgetown and gala events at the Kennedy Center. And at least for me, it's not like that at all. <laughs> uh, there's a, I mentioned the tremendous amount of reading. And yes, I read the Affordable Care Act before I voted for it. Uh, but it's a tremendous amount. Um, a tre tremendous amount of reading. And, and meeting with your constituents. Uh, this is a Congress on Your Corner uh, event that I did uh, primarily in, in you know, the early days of my career. You would, um, you would just set up a, a card table at a grocery store and get on the PA system and say, hey, Congressman Foster's here. If there's anything you want to talk about, uh, and then constituents come up and you just get the wide variety of questions. You get um, you know, screaming objections to Federal Reserve monetary policy or one of my favorites was a guy who, um, he put the asphalt sealer on his driveway and it wasn't drying and couldn't con Congress do something about that. And so you get, but it really reminds you of just you know, the, the real life and I, I find it very valuable to just you know, talk to the people I'm supposed to be representing as much as I can. 
Okay, but you know, so the question then arises, okay, why would anyone take this job? Well, um, there's this thing that, um, that they give you, uh, when you when you get elected. It's called the voting card. Uh, there's a little microchip in there that, um, that identifies the bearer as the representative of the uh, Illinois 11th Congressional District. And so you take that card and you walk across um, Independence Avenue and uh, up onto the steps onto the, into the Capitol and onto the floor of the U.S. House. And scattered around on the floor are little boxes of electronics. And you put your card in the slot and you press the red button or the green button and the world changes a little bit. And that is why you take the job. Everything else is just noise. And most of the time, we're voting on stuff that doesn't matter much. We're renaming a post office, or we're vo voting for something that we know the president is never going to sign, or that he'll certainly sign and didn't even need to be voted on. But sometimes you're voting you know, on really important things, like whether to commit $700 billion to keep our economy of taxpayer money to the banks to keep our economy from collapsing, or whether to uh, provide health care like access to health care for every man, woman, and child in the United States or not, or whether to rescue the automobile industries. And, and you know, those votes matter tremendously, and, uh, and that's really why you take the job. Um, so I was on Financial Services Committee during the collapse. We're coming up to the 10-year anniversary of all of that. Um, and so if you look at the tapes of all those famous hearings when, uh, you know, when you know, Bernanke and Paulson and Sheila Baer came to us and said, we need $700 billion or we will not have an economy next Monday. Um, you know, I was there listening to that testimony. Um, when the three automobile, the three failed auto, failing automobile makers came to us and said, we need a bailout or we will be um, closing up shop. Or we will be auctioning off of all of our production equipment and sending it to Asia. Uh, and had we not voted to rescue the, the automobile industry, we would not make cars in this country today. And so, you know, important things happened um, in that time. And this is, and then after the emergency response, there was also the legislation, legislative response to make sure that that would never happen again. This is one of my favorite pictures with a, um, I guess, a possibly recognizable future senator there. This is the signing ceremony for the Dodd-Frank bill that really, if you look at it in the last eight years since we passed that thing, we have had a stable financial system. And it is, it's, a, it's a tribute to what we put in the, in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street reform bill. Um, I, you know, as a young member of Congress, it was actually one of my pleasant surpri surprises about coming in. Um, you know, I thought that, well, you'd have to wait 30 years before you had enough seniority to affect things. But because I served on Financial Services Committee under Barney Frank, Barney Frank very rapidly realized that I knew what I was talking about. And so when we were crafting Dodd-Frank, um, uh, you know, it almost got to the point where he said, oh yeah, it's a Foster Amendment, and he'd kind of wave it through, which he did not do for other members of Congress. And so it's one of my pleasant surprises that you actually can get something done if you have, if you work on a committee with a chairman that, you know, that respects, uh, respects knowledge and facts and things like that. Um, and so I was reasonably successful in getting my amendments in. Um, let's see, I won't talk about this. Just absorb the numbers here. Whenever you hear about uh, manufacturing, you know, and the, the loss of manufacturing jobs in the United States, um, you analyze the color code of the arrows for a moment, and then we can go on to the next slide. <laughs> it's quite remarkable. Um, yeah, and so I serve on the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, the Science Committee, which is an interesting place. Uh, you know, it's, uh, there are times when it's just been completely partisan, where Democrats are fighting for decent bu science budgets and, and Republicans are trying to defend things like the, the Ryan budget with, you know, 17 to 20 percent cuts in essentially all science funding. Um, and so it gets partisan. When we talk about climate change, it gets partisan. But when we talk about really important issues, uh, you know, things like quantum computing or, or human genetic engineering, um, it actually becomes very bipartisan. And I think as soon as you talk about the far future, I think is what happens. Um, that, you know, if you look at just the breakthroughs in human genetic engineering, um, which are just sort of breathtaking, the CRISPR-Cas9 stuff. And um, so I, I, let's see, not long after the discovery, I started getting these increasing, as the only PhD scientist in Congress, I started getting these increasingly urgent requests for meetings by scientists who said, hey, there has been this breakthrough in genetic engineering, and Brave New World is not 100 years away, and it is probably not even 10. 
and that you should start thinking about this. And so I had a discussion and, uh, and was able to convince the Republican chair of the Science Committee to hold a hearing on, on human genetic engineering that included uh, Jennifer Doudna, who was uh, you know, arguably the inventor of, of the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, genetic engineering concept. And, and it, was a, it, was a great, it was a great hearing. That was attend People had thoughtful comments from both sides of the aisle. And it was, it was really encouraging that Congress can somehow. Um, but there are other times it's really tough. I guess if you, if you Google my name along with Greenland, uh, you're led to this uh, video and a uh, story and video about a, uh, one of the Republican witnesses in the committee who was brought in to dispute climate change. And he was trying to convince us that it was a matter of scientific debate whether or not it was a good thing if the Greenland ice sheet melted. Um, and so they're, they're, usually I try to stay as polite and respectful as I can, but I, I confess I got a little sarcastic in my response, which you can see in the video. And as I say, the, you know, we have, the budget has very often, unfortunately, budget for scientific things has become a very partisan issue. That, you know, budget after budget after budget during the Obama administration, uh, the president would uh, propose, you know, flat, uh, flat or increasing budgets. The counterproposal from uh, Paul Ryan and the Republicans would be, you know, quite massive cuts. Um, and, and so this is, um, it's a shame because I think everyone understands the importance of research to uh, our economy and national defense. And so why someone who understands that will not vote for it is, remains a mystery to me. Uh, you know, it was the dynamics of the recent omnibus discussion were interesting because uh, you know, right now it, it looks wonderful. For those of you who pay attention to budgets, you're probably smiling uh, because it's, it's been very good. But two weeks out on that negotiation, the scenario was not good. Uh, what was on the table there was a negotiation on one hand, uh, immigration policy, whether we do something for the dreamers or not, and on the other hand, uh, the budget. And, and so what we have um, in so at, one, at some point it became obvious the Republicans were not going to give us anything on the Dreamers and on immigration, at which point we said, okay, fine, in that case we want a really good number for, uh, and we're able to succeed in getting that. But had they offered us something real on Dreamers, then I would be faced with this question, okay, here are people whose lives are being wrecked uh, you know, by our stupid immigration policy, and am I going to actually, how do I trade that against, uh, you know, the, spending for research and development. And so there are tough votes on this thing, and, and that's why you know, it's not so easy. Another time when I felt it was very valuable being the last PhD scientist in Congress was during the debate over the Iran nuclear deal. Um, you know, this, if you read the text of the Iran nuclear deal, it had a, uh, there was a table, a one-page table of reactor core specifications for the modifications the Iranians had to do to their heavy water reactor so that it could never be used uh, to make large amounts of weapons-grade plutonium. And so Democratic and Republican members would just come after me and say, what the heck does this mean? How do I vote on this when it's, when the document we're talking about has a page of reactor core specifications. And so then, you know, I spent a lot of time explaining it to them at, at whatever level they could, they could um, absorb it, you know, that, you know, the fundamental representation of the one-year breakout time, that is, if Iran kept their part of the bargain and then decided to quit the treaty, that we would still have one year of response time uh, before they, um, you know, for a diplomatic or economic or, if necessary, a military response. Uh, and so that was, you know, that was the assurance that had to, um, had to be made there. And uh, this was, um, oh, <laughs> yeah, this is my press conference announcing my support uh, for the deal where I was flanked with, by Ernie Moniz, who I'm sure many of you know, and Dick Garwin, who uh, has just had a legendary career, much of which in, in areas that cannot be talked about. But he was a guy that Enrico Fermi said was uh, the only true genius he'd ever met. So if Enrico Fermi, and so I got to actually meet and work with uh, Dick Garwin, who is, uh, did not disappoint. <laughs> um, and you do, uh, there are a number of things that you um, get. If you're a member from Illinois and the president's from Illinois, uh, from time to time you get, uh, and you're flying home on the weekends, from time to time when the president's flying home on weekends, that he'll offer you a ride on his airplane. Um, 
uh, a couple weeks ago, three, actually a month ago now, I, um, I was spent the weekend on a nuclear submarine underneath the North Polar ice cap uh, because of an interest that I have in, in seeing if it's technically possible for the Navy to convert their reactors from high enriched uranium to low enriched uranium, which will have a huge impact on, on non-proliferation worldwide. Uh, but in order to just understand you know, what they're up to, uh, we, we spent a, uh, a weekend, among other things, with uh, we had a, a British sub and two American subs shooting fake torpedoes at each other under the ice cap. So it's, <laughs> it's rather interesting. And then you get challenged. It was a, a CODEL with multiple uh, delegations. And so you, you learn the sort of self-control that's necessary to spend 18 hours in a, in a submarine with Tom, Senator Tom Cotton uh, and staying polite to everything. Um, <laughs> So, and so this is the break room inside the, inside the nuclear sub. And then, oh, and I met on my way up there an uh, MIT professor, Arthur Bagaror, who maybe some of you know, uh, who does this fascinating research looking at, at propagation of sound waves in the Arctic, uh, which has military implications, so a lot of what he does can't be uh, published. Uh, but just a fascinating guy, and a guy that looks exactly like you would expect for someone who does research underneath the polar ice cap, <laughs> and, and just a great guy. <laughs> and, um, and, and I've also, because of nuclear pro proliferation, uh, where he spent a lot of time, I went on a, my grand tour of the nuclear weapons labs out west, and this is one of our stops, which is the, um, the Trinity test site, uh, where the first nuclear weapon was sent off. And there, is, there are a tremendous number of very smart people working behind the wall, as they say. And I think that we make a mistake in the scientific community in not respecting their work enough. Because if that, you know, there's a letter that the lab directors have to write to the president to say, yes, our nuclear stockpile, despite not being tested for 30 years, is reliable. And if you you're know about complex technical systems, that is something, that is a non-trivial representation to have to make. And if you're going to be doing that, you need a, an army of really smart people behind you making sure that that statement's true. And they're there. Uh, I think they're, they're not given the respect. Uh, you know, they give, up, they give up the ability to publish any of their results. Okay, these are people that could have great scientific careers and they make the sacrifice for their country. Uh, of, of essentially their scientific career. So we have to be very careful not to, to look down at people who've made that choice and to really uh, to thank them for, for their service. Um, and you know, I could give a whole lecture on nuclear weapons. It's, um, you know, anyway, so that's the last slide. You know, this is the, the thing you always have to come back to, the, the people you represent, because that's really, um, that's really what it's all about. All right, at this point, you know, the, what the agenda had me on for some god-awful long period of time, which I am, um, so at this point, I'm happy to just turn it over to any questions from the audience for as long as you have questions. And at some point, I have to get on an airplane, and um, Eric will drive me to the airport at that time. <laughs> yeah. Because I came, yeah, because I came in on a special, yeah, the, oh, the question is, when I came to Congress, what choice of committees did I have? Um, and so I had choice of committees um, where uh, some, there were a couple of junk committees that no one wants to be on. Uh, and I won't name them, <laughs> but there, there um, but then there are, but I came in on a special election, and that really limited my leverage. And so what happened is that I just took what was available, which ended up being financial services, which was not initially, would not have been my first choice, except that it turned out to be the most important committee in the US Congress for the, the first three years that I was in office. You know, I came in in March 2008, okay, and then the famous, you know, the famous uh, collapse of, of the economy happened in October. And so already the ship was leaking and going down uh, by, by March. And so I just spent a lot of the first three years that I was in Congress uh, understanding um, what was broken and had to be repaired on an emergency basis and, and the parts that were still working and, and should be just left alone while we, while we fixed the emergencies. And, and then later trying to understand what the rules uh, should have been in place to avoid that. 
Um, you know, I, I, I get angry to this day with the thought that the, the financial collapse that everyone suffered through did not have to happen. It was not an, you know, an act of the market. It was not an act of God. You know, it was a mistake. And it was a mistake that did not happen in other countries. That countries like Canada that maintained good underwriting of mortgages did not have a housing bubble. Uh, company, countries that had uh, decent capital requirements for their banking system did not have a Wall Street crisis. And uh, so this was not something that had to happen. Uh, it happened because a bunch of, frankly, you know, the power of a bunch of lobbyists convinced members of Congress to vote in ways that put our, our, the future of many people at risk. And, you know, I didn't know what to say for many of those first three years when families would come to me uh, and saying we're about to be foreclosed on our house. And these are people that had, um, you know, they'd been in that house for 40 years. Uh, they got, during the housing bubble, they got talked into a home equity loan uh, that uh, was ill-advised. And then um, they were underwater on their house. They lost their uh, job for a few months and all of a sudden they were being kicked out of a house they'd been in for 40 years. And that did not have to happen and did not happen in Canada. It did not happen in, in um, most of Europe, where they actually maintain uh, decent banking rules. And so, um, you know, it's things like that that get me fired up to make sure that, that we get the rules right. So, long answer to, <laughs> meandering answer to your question. Other? Yeah. Bill, how can um, APS be the most helpful in helping Congress do the right thing? Uh, and you can tell us what the right thing is. I mean, we can think about areas like <clears throat> funding for science, um, funding for education, other activities like that. But how, how can APS be the most helpful to, to help you? Well, there are technical areas. You know, one of the, one of the fights that I've been fighting for a long time is uh, to reinstate the Office of Technology Assessment. Uh, Rush Holt and I had been working on this. That did a lot of great work. Congress actually needs, uh, needs um, technical advice. You know, because no one, even, even those that are, have, you know, good analytic skills, just, you know, just don't have the time to think about every issue. You know, I, I wish I had the time to study the technology of genetic engineering, and I do not, uh, or, or all the issues involving nuclear weapons. Uh, there are a lot of physics issues that Congress needs advice on. You know, we are, we are continuing, and frankly, from my point of view, losing the, the ancient war over Star Wars, you know, the, the ballistic missile defense. And every time any committee of physicists has been put together uh, in, in a classified or unclassified setting, they have unanimously said that mid-course missile defense doesn't have a chance of working um, against, you know, even a North Korean level of opponent. Okay, not, not to mention, um, and yet we're in a situation where, our, where Congress and the President will make statements like the President recently made that, that the U.S. missile defense system has a 97% chance of taking out a North Korean missile. You know, the, the system he is talking about is one that has failed three times out of four when it has been tested. And yet someone is reporting up the command line or it's being misinterpreted by the President uh, to the point that he interprets that as a 97% chance per, per shot. And then, if, then he follows that up with, and then if we shoot two missiles, it's nearly 100%. And first off, you're not allowed to multiply probabilities when you're talking about like design failures because they will be common anyway. But that's, we're not even near that level of discussion on this. But there is an absence of advice. That, so we, you just have to make sure that your representative has at his or her disposal, you know, good physics advice. Just, you know, get a partnership. Whatever university uh, is in the district should have someone uh, who is there and, and volunteering to, to make that statement. The, um, you know, encourage members to serve on things like the committee of the National Academy and stuff that, that study these things and are as close to advice that is accepted on a bipartisan basis as exists. Um, so those are the two things. And then, you know, in terms of budgets, um, there are, you know, very important and successful, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, you know, when you just send your whole crew to knock doors on Capitol Hill, 
uh, that's useful, but it's even more useful to meet with your member in his or her home district in their office, set up a meeting there, and just say that, you know, I use this federal facility. You know, I, I may just be some universe in, university in the, you know, without any obvious connection, but if you let them know how much you depend on federally funded science, uh, then it has a real effect. And if you show up as a constituent, uh, then it's you know, less likely to be ignored than if you just simply show up um, with a group of people in an office and then then you, it's much more likely you'll be mistaken for just another special interest group. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I have so many questions, but I, since you talked about missile defense that is connected with the military budget, which this year is at a record high, and it gets supported by both sides of Congress, uh, to me, almost without thinking, because missile defense is one of those things that gets funded year after year after year. So uh, as the defense budget grows, of course, under the Paul Ryan economic scheme, other things get cut. Is there any hope of ending that trend upward? Well, th there's two aspects of that. You know, there is a purely technical evaluation you can do of the military budget. Um, I, and then there's the separate uh, balance that you strike between the security of our country and the amount of money you're willing to spend for it. Okay, and that, that second one, I don't believe there's a scientific answer to that one. Okay, that some people say, okay, I trust humanity will get better. We should just get rid of our armies and, and air forces entirely. There are other people that see no obvious limit to how much of our, what fraction of our GDP we should spend. I, I have, I'm unaware of any scientific principle that lets that balance be struck. On the other hand, there are places where you're trading one military weapon system for another, where we're making the wrong choice. You know, you can see in these missile strikes, okay, the missile strikes that recently happened, none of our manned aircraft got anywhere near the anti-aircraft systems. Even the B-2 bombers were held at standoff distance and then launched missiles in, okay? And that is because there is no point in having manned aircraft, period. You know, we're about to spend more than a trillion dollars on the next generation manned aircraft, okay? And for example, uh, you know, these modern fighters, uh, if, you're, if they're trying to complete a mission, uh, they, they can all operate either with the man under human control or in drone mode where the computer is doing it. You know, this is a necessary thing. They can return to base if the pilot blacks out. You don't want a you know, $200 million aircraft lost so that they just fly home under computer control. They can do lots of stuff under computer control. Um, and in fact, if you want the, the aircraft to complete its mission, it is more likely to complete that without the human aboard because the airframes can take, you know, I don't know, 15 Gs, but, the, uh, but with the human aboard, you can only take maybe seven. And so if you're trying to dodge an anti-aircraft missile, you're better off not having the person aboard. Okay, and those are the sort of arguments that, that should convince Congress that even if we're going to need some military capability to develop, to, you know, deliver some bomb somewhere. Let's do it in the place, that, in the way that makes technical sense, in the form of an unmanned drone rather than these big expensive manned aircraft. And so that's the sort of thing, it's a purely technical trade-off where physicists can and should weigh in on the technical aspects of it. But then it must be very frustrating when you're not listened to. Um, <laughs> yeah, if, that, if you get frustrated and quit, then things go nowhere. You just have to keep plugging. say that uh, climate change is probably the most important issue of our time and unfortunately it's become so polarized that the scientific aspects get neglected. Uh, what do you feel, what can be done to depolarize the debate that's going on now? That's a tough one. You know, some of the most discouraging discussions that I have um, you know, with other members of the aisle is when they will have one of these polarized debates. And they'll come up to me afterward and say, Bill, you were right. You know, I believe, you know, it's pretty clear this climate change is a big deal, but I just can't vote that way in my district. Okay? And that's, that's tough because, you know, then I bite my tongue, but part of me just says, what the heck are you doing in Congress? 
you should be, you know, someone defined leadership once as, as disappointing your supporters at a, at a rate that they can absorb. And there, there's a lot of wisdom in that. And they should spend a little of their political capital disappointing their, their supporters that maybe there isn't a long-term future in burning coal and venting it in the atmosphere, that maybe that's actually the situation we're in. And, um, and it, it's tough because, you know, many, you know, I, part of my district is not well off. I represent Joliet, uh, sections of Aurora. Um, and, and sections of those cities are doing wonderfully, Sex of them not so well. And when I go back and visit them after being in Congress, I say, what can I really do that will really help them? Uh, many members of Congress represent areas that are poor and going downhill, and many of them rural areas. And so what can they really do? You know, and so you, they end up having to fight for things that they know are probably losing causes. You know, they're fighting to preserve unneeded military bases that the Pentagon doesn't even want because they're the only source of jobs in their district. And I can't really fault them for that, but I can't fault the system. We have to, you know, we have to find ways to, uh, you know, to do the right thing from an economic point of view while still preserving the human, the human damage that comes if we just let, you know, cold-blooded economic analysis determine everything. So it's, again, no scientific principle, uh, you know, allows you to make that trade-off. Thank you. Um, so my question is about approaching Congress as a constituent, as you were speaking about. And so I guess my question is, how is the best, what is the best way for me to do this? Like, how can I find out when Congress is going to show up at my Jewel Osco and I can explain that the DOB grant pays oh. for my groceries? Oh, no, you just contact your, um, your congressman's or congresswoman's district office. You know, they're all, you go to the, you know, you know in my case, foster.house.gov, you go to the house.gov website, you find a directory, and then you'll see multiple offices there, uh, one of which is in Washington, D.C., and two or three typically are in, in your local area. And so just, you know, drop them an email. If you're, uh, very often um, there's a contact form, you know, you can't just email them, but there's a contact form where you have to actually specify your zip code and they may not pay attention to you if you complain and you're not in their district. Right. You know, because I know the, and the amount of incoming, well, we'll call it correspondence out of politeness, uh, <laughs> that comes from out of my district is enormous and we simply can't. I don't want to burn my staff time answering, you know, people that I'm not representing. Um, and, and so, but if you are a constituent mm -hmm. and contact them, most, most, and ask for a meeting, uh, you will at least get a meeting with the staff. And if you're able to impress the staff that you're, you're talking about something important, uh, often a second meeting or uh, with a member of Congress themselves. And that meeting in the district, uh, if you can organize a group, you know, a group of five or 10 people, mm -hmm. much more likely to get a meeting with the, with the member. And so if you have five or 10 people from your district, you know, that will be paid attention to. Um, and so that's uh, at least as valuable as going to, to Washington and knocking on doors. All right, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah thank you. I, I wanted to thank you for uh, remembering the Office of Technology Assessment along with Rush Holt. I worked there for 10 years, in fact, on missile defense, among other things. So I'm very glad to hear that people are still thinking about this, and maybe one day something like this will happen. Well, that's, you know, that's an interesting, we actually are having some progress. There's a decent chance we may have a hearing on it for the first time in, in decades on the merits of it and actually bring it up and start having a debate for it. Well, that's, because, that, that's the best news I've heard. It calls yeah. for a drink. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I have a rule that I never touch alcohol before my last speech of the day. Okay, sorry. Good idea. But I, what, what I wanted to uh, uh, say was to expand a little bit more on uh, Roger Falcone's question and uh, ask not what APS could do, but what can the professional scientific community do broadly thought of, AAAS and all the, all the other professional organizations? Because I sense that there is a kind of a war on science going on. It's not going to last forever. It may not last very long. But science really feels under attack, not just from funding, but from, uh, as, a, as a, a compartment of the attack on truth and the attack on evidence. Do you have any idea or any suggestions what the scientific community writ large could possibly do now beyond going and knocking on doors in Congress? We do that already. Yeah. yeah. Well, I um, spent yesterday morning in the shivering cold in Geneva, Illinois, and marching for science. Um, you know, and frankly, when I was there, I was joined by two uh, candidates running for Congress, 
uh, against members who had been voting in sort of an anti-science way. Uh, and, and so this is actually, um, uh, well, the, the first best answer is that uh, some fraction of the best and brightest of every one of our generations should just run for office. You know, there is not, an ex there's not a substitute for that. And it, it, there is a merit to serving in political office at any altitude. You know, scientists and engineers are needed um, at, and on the school boards, you know, on city councils, uh, in the state houses, as well as in Congress, the Senate. And so this is a, you know, just put that away, you know, put a pin in it. Uh, with the idea of going back to that, you know, after you, um, you know, win the Nobel Prize and, uh, and um, especially the younger people in the audience, when, you, when you've had a successful career, you know, think about spending part of your time in, in public service. Uh, another, another thing that um, I, I really feel strongly about is that there is a, um, we don't adequately respect people, good scientists who spend their careers in the federal science bureaucracy. That though they are crucial to having the really high quality um, advice there. You know, people in, in you know, NSF, DOE, NIH, um, you, you name it, um, make hundred million dollar decisions with taxpayer money. And on the other hand, you have, um, you know, you have, Scientists at top universities grunting out their their 20-page, 50-page proposal for $30,000, and you know it's um, it's a misallocation of human capital not to put uh, some of our best and brightest in that area. The budgets, the details of the budgets, are worked out in an elaborate mechanism with the administration, called, which involves the pass back and all of this. Uh, the the AAAS has very good lectures on how the budget works, but what happens is that all of that is happens in secret. It is deliberately kept away from me, because as you know, I represent Argonne National Lab, and if I get wind of the fact that they're thinking of cutting things at Argonne, I'm going to start making noise because that's my job. And so they keep it secret from me. And who is in the room when those detailed decisions are made on the budget are the scientific staff in, inside the Department of Energy, NSF, you know, all the scientific agencies, uh, and then um, more and more political bureaucrats at higher levels. And so the arguments that are made in favor of changing the balance, the scientific balance, or increasing the overall level are made by those scientists who've decided to make their careers inside. Um, and, you know, and, the, and the, so it's really important that you and that all the scientific societies encourage their best and brightest to spend a good part of their careers um, in there. So, hey, thanks very much. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm part of a group based out of Fermilab that goes to DC every year and um, argues for high energy physics funding. Um, so I think a lot I served of on that, the User's Executive Committee? or That's correct, else. yeah, UEC. Yeah, I, if you look on the ancient archives of there, you'll find I, I did the same thing back in the late 90s, I think. Yeah, awesome. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but a lot of our meetings were not constituents, hmm. and so we kind of just say we're representing um, all the high energy physicists in the country. But I guess I was wondering what kind of an impact are we actually having, in your opinion, and what can we do better? Well, you know, I actually get a lot of good feedback. Now, it's a little bit funny because, like, people know who I am, and other members of Congress know I'm that science guy, and mo many of them know I worked at Fermilab. And so when you go around and talk to offices, they say, oh, your, your Fermilab people are in town. So I am probably not a representative, um, you know, receiving antenna for that particular signal because it, it sort of gets focused on me. Uh, but it's... Uh, um, I think it's very valuable, well, in the case of Fermilab, which is an organization, one of many, that has scientists from all over the country, that when you have a scientist from New Jersey, when you talk to someone from New Jersey, have someone from a university in New Jersey present in that meeting, if you can possibly do it. Uh, that, that really is a multiplier because, you know, and there's a tendency for members of Congress and senators to sort of separate humanity, separate humanity into two classes, constituents and everyone else, uh, and people that can vote for them and, and irrelevant people. And, and it's part of the survival imperative, I understand it, but it's actually a very good, um, a very good thing. So see if you can get, um, 
you know, particularly for the, the uh, universities that are within a, a day's commute of, of Washington, D.C., um, have them show up alongside um, and then say yes. Because it's a very powerful statement that if you're arguing, for example, for Fermilab, to, um, to say, hey, I'm from New Jersey and I use the facilities at Fermilab. And you tell that to a member from New Jersey and they will listen. Hello, so I was wondering, what are some of the skills that were, are most important in politics and both um, being in Congress, being on the campaign trail, and also for people who want to get involved maybe in a different way than by directly running for office that would not necessarily have been trained for in the academic or research system? Well, let's see, just, well, I think everyone that knew me in physics just confidently predicted that I would blow up my career within, you know, six weeks by saying what I really thought. Hmm. Okay, so that one of the things, now, I, you know, I don't regard it as lying if you don't, you don't agree with something and you just stay quiet. Okay, so that when, you know, you have to take 200 milliseconds when some wisecrack comes into your brain to say, okay, what am I actually accomplishing with this wisecrack I'm about to say? All right, so that, that is something that, and it turns out that's a, a learnable skill. It is not high, hardwired in. At least for me, I was able to unlearn that behavior that I'd lived by for all my years in physics. Um, and, and so that's, that's part of it. Um, you know, you have, to, you have to be able to be more analytical looking back at yourself. You know, you, you have to analyze what you're trying to accomplish, what, you re, what your plan really is. Uh, you know, at, at a deep level, physicists often don't plan. They just sort of say, this is fun, I will work on this today. Okay, whereas, and on the other hand, at the other extreme, um, a lot of politicians go too far and they enter politics with an 18-year plan to become president. Okay, and that generates a sick way of thinking where everything is, is analyzed. Is this, is this decision good politically for me or not? Is this vote good for me or not? And, and I have a lot of trouble with that. And so that I think the most valuable skill to, you know, it's a skill or a personality trait or something that, you know, again, you know, it's something you can reinforce over time, is to, to really think about the people you're trying to help all the time. You know, if the, this is, should never be about you. You know, that, that, you know, most of you in this audience are in the top 10th of your high school class. You know, you are very lucky and talented people who could succeed at many things. And if any of you decide that you're gonna spend part of your life in service to your fellow man, you have to remember that a lot of people struggle harder than you struggle. That they can't say, well, if I don't make it, if I don't get tenure here, I can just make a lot of money as a programmer in Silicon Valley. That's not an option for a lot of people. And so that you have to really understand that because people very quickly sense, voters have this very good sense of when you're just in this for yourself, um, and so you have to, before you even enter politics, you know, look inside yourself and, and make sure that you're doing this, not because you think it would be really neat to, you know, like wear this, wear this pin that says you're a member of Congress, but actually, you know, the, the people that are in line ahead of you in the grocery store and staring at their wallets trying to figure out how they're going to pay for the food this week, that those people too, um, you know, have a place in our society. And anyway, if you, if you think about that enough, then you can't, avoid letting it come out when you talk to people. And they sense that. And that, at least the people I respect in Congress the most, are the ones that are smart as heck and still understand why they're in this business. Um, and so that, I don't know, that, that's the most, my, you know, everything else, you know, obviously I have all the charisma of the usual physicist. So it's, uh, you, know, you don't have to be able to give a great speech, but you do have to be able to explain to people that you're trying to do the right thing. Um, I have a question which might be more psychological, but I've been very frustrated by this, that when you talk to people, they use their own prism. And it became really clear when Catherine Hayhoe gave a talk, who is a climate scientist, and she had a graph that showed that uh, if you're from in the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, or the Tea Party, you have a view on whether climate science, global warming exists or not. And as education has increased, 
the Tea Party members and the Republican members, and I, I'm not going to say political, she got the numbers, became more denying of climate science. And that could also be applied to, can women do physics? And there's many, many things of which there's overwhelming scientific data that, you know, it's, it's just science, as they say. And you try to argue with someone that's looking at their own prism, and they get better and better at arguing that women can't do science or, you, you know, all the issues. And so when we do go to Congress and we argue, it's always how can you benefit the district, et cetera. But how do you think we can get across to people when there is scientific evidence and they use it against you and cherry pick the data? Um, how do you get across to someone that can make decisions when more data doesn't help? Do you have an idea how to do that? Well, I think one of the, the reasons that scientists are at a disadvantage in this is that we're always talking about probabilities. You know, I mean, there, there's some non-zero probability that the, all the experiments we've done on gravity have accidentally fluctuated to, you know, to produce the results that we kind of believe. And so, you know, everything in the end in science is a probabilistic statement. And the voting public does not do well with probabilities. You know, when after September 11th, every member of Congress, every politician said, I want to make sure this will never happen again. Okay, and in fact, you know, if you actually analyze what has to be done to society to make that sort of attack impossible, I don't think most of us want to live in that kind of society. And so what you have to do is actually talk about the real trade-off of, you know, how intrusive you want, uh, you know, how policing of our society to be versus the risks of, of terrorism. Uh, and so these are, it's tough. You can't, um, one, one of the dangers that scientists often fall into is sort of speaking out of school. They try to leverage their expertise in science into, um, into conclusions that go outside the realm of science. You know, that you say, well, I'm an expert on, on climate change. A scientist can say all the data for why they think that, you know, the climate is changing. They can make best estimates for what uh, technologies um, are available and will be available, acknowledging that that's probabilistic. You know, we can put a lot of money into fusion and maybe it will never be relevant for climate change. You know, and that's, and so you have to acknowledge the probabilistic nature there and then a lot of people lose interest. Um, and so it's, it's not easy, but, but a mistake that you can make is to saying, well, um, I believe climate change is real, therefore you do exactly what I say and spend this much money on this and that technology. That is speaking out of school because, you know, you're, the trade-off for many members of Congress is they have people who are not eating well every night um, and then you're telling them to go spend money on research that's only going to be important 100 years ago when some of their constituents are unable to get medical care and, and unable to feed their families. And so trying to, you know, I don't know how you balance that. There's no scientific principle. And you just have to be respectful on that and, and stand your ground on the, the pure technological facts and don't, don't go past them. Good afternoon, Congressman. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer all these questions. <clears throat> I wanted to keep it in the knowledge and wisdom realm, but pull a little bit away from physics. Uh, one thing I remember when you were just starting uh, not only were you working with um, Senator uh, Congressman Frank on a Dodd-Frank uh, bill legislation, but I remember you telling uh, some stories about how he uh, took you under his wing, uh, not just as an assistant for the financial committee, but as someone he recognized as being uh, very intelligent in Congress. And uh, he took the time to explain to you that um, if you were dealing with members of Congress who might not uh, understand the realities of how to implement these policies, that one of the ways you could keep them under control was to make sure that every uh, I was dotted, every T was crossed, and every single rule in the Congressional Handbook was followed. So I wonder if you might explain a little bit to these um, physicists and colleagues of yours uh, about how there are ways to keep the radical members uh, under control while uh, not offending them? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. I spent a lot of time sort of musing about the design mechanisms that might be applied to make Congress work better. And, you know, the fundamental problem, design problem in democracy, is how do you treat the minority fairly? 
Because, you know, there are a lot of people in recent years and other countries uh, who've embraced democracy as a way to go and get revenge on other ethnic groups. You know, they we're in the majority, now we can vote ourselves in the majority and vote laws that just make life hell for the minority. And the same thing happens in the U.S. Congress. Uh, you know, it's a very much a winner-take-all system. If you can assemble a majority to elect a speaker, then you control every single thing that gets voted on. And, there is, and if you're on the losing side of that vote, you have almost no control over it. And so this is, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the early days we tried operating, uh, operating the U.S. House without a strong speaker and it was sort of a disaster that you just have, you know, someone would bring up a bill for a vote and it would get passed, and then someone would bring up a contradictory bill for a vote and it would get passed too. And, you know, it was nuts. And so uh, you actually need to have, you know, an organized set of institutions. And, I, you know, one of the worst things that's happened is a failure to, uh, by people coming into Congress, uh, to actually take the time to study why the system is the way it is before just complaining about it. And that's, um, there are a lot of uh, very well thought out rules, largely to strike this balance of, of how you treat the minority uh, fairly. And that's, um, you know, I, I think that right now, the minority party does not have enough power. Um, I even felt that way a little bit when we were in the majority. So it'll be interesting to see if, you know, uh, anyway, that, that's the biggest question. The, the very complicated rules are, are set up in most cases, in many cases, uh, to provide at least some option if, you, if you're in the minority and, and would otherwise have no power at all. Um, it's, you know, my, my sort of dream for the way it should work and is uh, um, I, I had this discussion with someone who was a very, very senior member, who was no longer serving, but had been around in, in many configurations of Congress. He said whenever the party, the balance in the parties got really tight, that there was a shift in power away from leadership and, and towards these sort of shifting coalitions that form on every issue. That you'd have one, one coalition that would pass the farm bill as a coalition between people that wanted you know, good food stamp funding in the cities and, and agricultural subsidies in the rural areas. Uh, and you'd have uh, the coalition that passed the military budget. Um, and that these were much less partisan things Right now, if one party has a big majority in a winner-take-all system, if you want a bill passed, you have to go and make an appointment with the staff of the Speaker of the House. And otherwise, you're not going to have your, not even a vote on the bill you're putting on. That's not healthy. And so I think that tweaks that we can make to empower the minority party, uh, I think if I could have one ask for how Congress operates, that would probably be it. Hi, Congressman. I'd like to start with a couple of thank yous, and then I have a question. Um, so I represent Northern Illinois University and the Science Coalition. So thank you for the work you do for, uh, for my region. Now, and where, where were you marching yesterday? So uh, I was actually not because I was here, and I don't think we had a march from the APS here. Um, okay. But, but thank you for marching. Right, we'll let you off the hook. All right. So I think, I think my boss may have been with you, Jerry Blazy. Um, so thank you for the work you do for the region, um, and thank you for being a champion of science through the Science Coalition. Um, and thank you very much for the very strong budget that we saw for science in 2018. Um, so my question to you is... Uh, uh, just don't count on it. I mean, uh, that, that, was a very, I was that was a very tough discussion that could have landed the other way. Okay. okay. You know, I'm very proud that we pulled it off in the end, but you know, we lost in a lot of areas in that negotiation too. So. Can you say anything about the timing of fiscal year 2019 appropriations? No one is thinking about that right now. You know, the the complete focus. Uh, you know, we're I, I anticipate we're going to have more and more days that we're supposed to be voting canceled uh, by Republicans because their members, those that have not resigned and or retired, uh, those who are running for re-election, want to get back home and campaign. Uh, and so I think that we're not going to see anything major done probably until after the election. That I think we're going to, you know, we'll my guess, if I had to guess, that we're going to see a CR at the levels of the omnibus for at least a year from now. Um, that, that would be my guess. I, but trying to, you know, trying to psychoanalyze the, 
the majority party in this right now is not often a winning <laughs> a winning game. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we have anyone? I'm now. I'm a little confused. This thing was listed on the agenda as an hour and a half. I've gone an hour and twenty minutes. So I'm happy to let any any. Well, first off, just feel free to just meander out. I feel guilty for filibustering this long, but happy to happy to answer questions until until Eric tells me that my plane is awaiting. So. Uh, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to build off the last question and ask you something probably awkward, but I am curious what your opinion is. Um, how's it looking for the midterm elections? Well, this is, this is a nonpartisan organization. I, I have to be <laughs> careful. Okay. Uh, why, why don't we talk afterwards on that? I, I'm just a little leery. I mean, it's, the, the APS uh, is, you know, it's, advice is valued because it is, you know, it, it provides nonpartisan scientific advice, and I think we should work hard to, you know, Keep I'm happy to talk you, to you on the coffee, at the coffee break afterwards. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, no problem. No problem. Well, you know, I've, I've already sort of gone close to the edge of that cliff, but that was, that was a step or two too far. <laughs> well, this is uh, kind of related to that comment. So I, I've marched in a couple of these marches for science, but have felt uh, a little uneasy about it, wondering what the strategy ought to be because you don't want to say that supporting science is uh, is a partisan deal and politicize it and I worry that having these marches further politicizes the uh, the issue so I just wanted to get your take on that if, if you look at the signs now uh, in the March for science uh, they were um, I, I think um, my, my favorite one was, uh, um, you, you should be a transformer, not a resistor. Okay. <laughs> and where, where they were the electronic symbols for transformer and resistor. <laughs> uh, and, and just a number of these. And they were actually um, insisting on the role of facts in our, in our political debate. That's as political as they got. And, and this is something where, you know, if you look at... Um, you know, the history of humanity. Uh, it was when we, for millennia, it was the point of view, the truth was whatever the strong man or strong woman said it was, okay? And it's only when we got away from that that we started really advancing as a species, uh, that we understood there's this thing called objective truth. Um, and, uh, and all of the instincts, you can sort of understand why, you know, we submit to the alpha male, that part of our brain does that. You know, it's a very useful, from an evolutionary point of view, it is a very evolutionarily useful thing to have some tribal cohesion when you get attacked by the nearby tribe. You know, it, it makes evolutionary sense, as do a lot of the bad behaviors um, that are built in, hardwired into us. You know, and we have to just, um, we have to recognize that bad behavior and lean hard against it. That when we understand that yes, there is this this situation that humans can get into, where there's someone up at the microphone screaming lies at them, and the whole crowd is going, yes, we agree with this lie, that everyone will join in that agreement, that the part of your brain will do that, and it's ended very badly for for you know countries where that happened, and so we have to recognize it. We have to recognize it. Recognize why part of our brain triggers. Um, that way and just say, okay, that's amusing, um, but I'm not going to pay attention to that part of my brain because we've evolved. Um, but that, that's how I see this problem. And it, the, the difficulty is that every, every generation has to relearn that. Um, you know, one of the great things about, you know, the March for Science and other, and other um, expressions of enthusiasm that have arisen in the last few months is that the next generation is involved in this. And that they're 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 going to come out. They're going to get involved in, in public life and, and vote and things like that. So that uh, that has to happen for every generation. All right, the microphones are barren, and so I just want to thank you, thank you all. And if there's any young person you know, uh, and with a scientific bent to him or to her who it just, you think, has a chance of getting involved in, in you know, the political life of our country, um, please encourage them. 
And if you see someone starting out, help them. Uh, help them, give them encouragement, because that is probably the highest leverage thing uh, that anyone in this room can do to, to make our country work better. So thank you all.